Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for uh, joining us at this very special In Conversation event about mental health. My name is Sue Hunt, and it's my great privilege to be the Chief Executive Officer of the Royal Children's Hospital Foundation. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we gather on traditional lands of Aboriginal people and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Today, we're joining you from Wurundjeri land and for wherever you are today, I hope you acknowledge Elders. A warm welcome to everyone joining us online. While we were wishing to uh, have some folk in the room with us here today, uh, due to our last, uh, latest COVID-19 winter surge, and to ensure the safety of all our staff, our patients and our families, we've moved to a virtual setting. So we do have some very special guests with us. You're all most welcome, but I just wanted to acknowledge a few guests. We have some Royal Children's Hospital Foundation board members and staff online. We have RCH board members and staff online. We have members of our incredible donor community, including our legacy donors, our 1870 society members, community supporters, the RCH champions, our major donors and philanthropic partners, our trusts and foundation funders, our bed sponsorship donors, our corporate supporters and workplace givers, and our regular monthly donors, the Children's Tree supporters. We have members of the RCH 1000, including, I'm delighted to see Barry Novi OAM, who is chairman of the RCH 1000. And we have members of the Good Friday Appeal team, including Rebecca Cowan, the Executive Director of the Appeal, and their supporters, and I'm delighted to welcome the Decuba Foundation as well. Members of our Auxiliaries Network, including Dr. Miriam Weiss, OAM, who's President of the RCH Auxiliaries. So a great uh, lineup of people, and you're all most welcome. It's also my great pleasure to welcome our speakers today. Dr. Rick Haslam, who is the Director of the Mental Health Program, Associate Professor Michelle Telfer, who's Director of the RCH Gender Service, Adam Blake, who's the Nurse Unit Manager of the Banksy Award, Arnie Krishnan, who's Cocoon Care Coordinator at Butterfly Ward, and Polly Sinjin, who's Co Cocoon Co Care Coordinator of the Butterfly Ward as well. A special thank you all for taking time out of what I know is incredibly busy schedules to be here today. And finally, I would like to acknowledge NAB for hosting us in this wonderful space. I'm only sorry that no one can be with us today, but it is a beautiful space. And NAB's partnership uh, with us and with the Good Friday Appeal over many years is truly transformational. We do look forward to welcoming you, you all at some future event, hopefully here in person. So, Today's event uh, is going to be a conversation all about the mental health services and the new strategy at the Melbourne Children's Mental Health Strategy. This ambitious multi-year project will bring together experts from across the Melbourne Children's Campus, so that's the Royal Children's Hospital, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and the University of Melbourne's Department of Paediatrics, all working together to deliver a fundamental shift in the management of mental health of infants, children, and adolescents on campus. This project, like many others across the hospital, has been made possible thanks to philanthropy. And we'd like to acknowledge the following donors who've already committed to help us deliver this project. So all the dedicated members of the, Royal, uh, of the RCH 1000 who are generously supporting the research arm of the strategy, the Andrew and Geraldine Buxton Foundation, the DeCuba Foundation via the Good Friday Appeal, and finally, the Woodcock Family Trust. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Mr. David Niven, who is trustee. He's joining us online today. So I hope this session will inspire some of you to join these generous donors in bringing this project to life. As well as hearing about the mental health strategy, you will also gain insight into the project's past, present and future that have been made possible thanks to philanthropy. So before we get going, a few little bits of housekeeping. So this is an in-conversation event, so you're going to have the opportunity to ask questions during the Q&A section a little bit later on after our presentations. So please feel free to type your questions into the chat box at any time. There's also live captioning available for the event. 
uh, which you can switch on. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious where you can sit, switch that on. So these captions are automatically generated. So they might not be perfect, but we do hope they help you if you need to. So my very great pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker, Dr. Rick Haslam. Rick has worked in public mental health for children and adolescents for almost 20 years. Uh, he has a master's in child and adolescent mental health at the Institute of Psychology, Psychiatry, Psychology and Neurosciences in London. And we were very delighted to be able to welcome him back from London uh, to, to work with us continuing at the hospital. He is the Director of Mental Health Program here at the RCH. And Rick, we're very excited to hear from you. Thanks so much, Sue. And uh, it's just such a pleasure. And I'm so thrilled to be here talking uh, with you all today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about mental health as a department at the Children's, but also some of the great opportunities through the department and also the campus mental health strategy. Uh, I've led the mental health service at the Children's for over 10 years, and this is by far the most exciting time for children and for our staff. So the mental health service at the Royal Children's Hospital uh, is quite a large department and has, as you can see, many parts to it. Uh, what we're really all about is children who will become teenagers, who will become adults and parents themselves. As many of you would know, there's been an incredible surge in demand for mental health services uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. What this little uh, triangle shows you is that 3% of children in Victoria will have severe and complex mental health difficulties. They're the 3% that we uh, are involved in supporting, but that 3% um, has probably, if not doubled, then certainly increased substantially during this time. Uh, there's a huge amount of unmet need in specialist mental health as well. And as a result, there's been very high rates of children and teenagers presenting to our emergency department. It's probably jumped by about 50%. The reason I've drawn the little arrows in here is because part of our role, I guess, is to support paediatricians, GPs, psychologists, school support staff in helping uh, children given that unmet need. What we're really all about is helping children from, from birth all the way through into adolescence. And we need different services and different systems for infants that we need for teenagers. What we wanna have is an integrated, a tiered system that really meets the needs of children and adolescents at different stages. And so an example of that, which we're just uh, starting off is a, a hub a little bit like a headspace service, but a hub in Brimbank and Melton for children and families. We also recognise that a lot of the mental health difficulties we see in children are co-occurring with other, other challenges. Many of you would know of the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system, the final report which came out uh, in 2021. There were 65 recommendations and essentially it's about expanding and working differently in, in the area that I work. And as I sort of said at the start, it's really a once in a lifetime opportunity for us. We're gonna be growing our service from maybe 170 staff to three or 400. We're gonna be including people with what's called a lived experience. So people who've either cared for or had themselves an experience of mental health difficulties. And we're gonna be much more outcomes driven. We're gonna be much more about the results for, for children and families and what they want. It's just such a great opportunity for earlier intervention when you start looking at children and young people. There's an economic argument, but from what, where I see it, there's also a human element as well. So over the next two or three years, we're going to be building a specialised service for zero to 11 year olds. And what we wanna do is align that with the work of the campus mental health strategy, which I've just, just about to go on and talk a little bit about and build a, a training and workforce development component for Victoria. So what we think great care in mental health is, is it's delivered with consumers, with patients and their families. It's accessible, uh, it's affordable, it's flexible, it's measured so that there are outcomes and results and it's consistent. That's what we're all talking about in our department. So maybe if I turn to the campus mental health strategy, which takes in the whole of the Royal Children's and all of its children and families. This is the vision of the, of the campus strategy and I won't read the whole thing out, but it's a pretty ambitious vision that goes from advocacy and prevention all the way through to clinical guidelines for actual care of children and adolescents. 
So what it's all about is centering on the family, family, what we call family centered care and bringing in consistent care, uh, bringing in clinically driven research that will make a difference to our care and also really training and building the capacity of our staff, all of the staff of the children's. So that then brings us into an integrated system of mental health care, not just for the 3%, but for the 100%. So family-centred care is really the key. What we want and what families say they want is ease of navigation. They don't want waiting lists. They don't want to have to be rationed in the care that they're getting. And they want to genuinely participate in the care that we're delivering. So family-centred care is really at the heart of the campus mental health strategy. I'm sorry that this slide, the, the, uh, the font is a little bit small, but you can see that there's a lots, there are lots of opportunities for impact that we'll see with the campus strategy. Increasing the literacy, the understanding of mental health in parents and, and children, support pathways and programs that align, that make it easier for people to get the care that they need and uniting mental health research in a common vision. So these are the things that the campus mental health strategy over the next, at least the next two or three years and probably the next four or five years will be bringing. Again, this is a, uh, a graphic which demonstrates the main areas of what we're talking about in the campus strategy. So we wanna see consistent care. We wanna see high quality care all the time. We wanna see research that's brought in and affecting the, the lives of children. And as I said before, we really wanna work on education and training of the next generation of clinicians. So what it means for mental health? Well, it means building the capacity in the community. It means embedding research in, in routine practice and training the next generation of clinicians. So this is, uh, this is our focus and this is where we'll be taking it. And what I hope that we'll be able to partner with some of you in the future on is exceptional mental health care for all Victorian children. And on that note, I'll finish. Good on you, Rick. Thanks Thank you soon. so much. Um, very insightful presentation. It was fantastic to learn more about the Melbourne Children's Mental Health Strategy uh, and how philanthropy can help the hospital and its campus partners um, achieve those big health goals. It's our um, delight to be supporting to be supporting that. So now I'd like to turn to our next guest, Associate Professor Michelle Telfer. Delighted to introduce her. Michelle is a paediatrician and is Director of the Department of Adolescent Medicine at the RCH. She's also Director of the RCH um, Gender Service, of which, and she's been instrumental in its development and expansion since 2012. Michelle is a passionate advocate for legal change and improved access to uh, medical and mental health care for transgender and gender diverse children and adolescents in Australia. And we thought that you would be very interested to hear about some of those issues today. So Michelle, thank you so much, over to you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to start uh, this afternoon by bringing in the voices of trans and gender diverse young people. I was nervous, I was upset, I was sad, I was confused. When I was younger I had um, dysphoria but I didn't know what it was and I just thought I was depressed or I thought something else was wrong with me. The fact that my body doesn't match with who I am just causes extreme discomfort and anxiety. I was getting bullied um, at school. I was very depressed and suicidal. And like a lot of my family have disowned me. No mother expects their child to say, I'm not who you think I am. Um, People aren't very nice a lot of the time. It was really nice to know that my family supports that. And since then I, I began the steps to transition to who I actually am. I think it was my parents actually did some research and that's when they came across the, uh, the gender clinic at the Royal Children's. 
They accepted me. They told me, yes, she is transgender. Mummy had a little cry because she didn't realise that this whole entire time that it was true I was a girl. Without a service like this, there'd be two or three years where they're just not able to move forward with, you know, the transitioning that a lot of the time they really need for their mental health. I'm so glad I'm in the generation that it is here because <laughs> it's just made my life so much easier and I wouldn't you know, have to hide. I was expecting like a normal hospital, but this is way more than a normal hospital to me. This has helped me a lot. When I came here, it was like everyone knew what they were talking about. The doctor I spoke to knew everything, getting everything right, was telling me how these are your options, this is what's going to happen, this is what can happen. They just reassured me that everything's going to be okay and that I am normal. They're so amazing, they're such nice people. They really do help a lot of people and save lives. It's just a place that people will care for you and love for you for who you are. Thank you. I think what's probably most important when talking about the gender service is really um, reflecting on the rapid social change that's occurred over the last 10 to 15 years. And what we've seen with a huge increase in accessibility, in acceptance uh, and visibility of trans and gender diverse people generally, we've seen these changes in clinical, in political and legal contexts. And if we think about the clinical context of this social change, what we see are incredible increases in the number of young children and adolescents, young adults who are coming forward uh, wanting to um, affirm their gender and seeking help from us uh, in that process. So when we first started to see young trans and gender diverse people was back in 2003 when we had our first referral. And when I took over managing the gender service in 2012, that year we had less than 20 young people. Last year we had 821 new referrals. So it's an incredible increase. And we see this correlation between the acceptance, the support and visibility of trans people in the community with help seeking in a medical context. And we know that trans young people suffer from mental health conditions in, um, in very high numbers. This study was done um, in, in Perth initially, um, but was nationwide. And what they found when asking trans young people and also their parents is that high numbers have anxi anxiety disorders, high number have eating disorders, and nearly 75% had depression. And what's even more frightening than that is that in this, um, this group that was up to the age of 25, 80% had self-harmed and 48% had attempted suicide. So what can we do to help? Well, at the RCH Gender Service, what we do is support young people by affirming their gender identity. And this is what the research uh, tells us makes an incredible difference to their mental health outcomes. There are standards of care that uh, the team at the Royal Children's Hospital uh, led and wrote and published in the Medical Journal of Australia in 2018. And um, to our great delight, The Lancet decided to write an editorial about these guidelines, which I've highlighted in this, um, in this uh, last paragraph here, um, which I'm struggling to read from this distance. But essentially what they outline is that um, with the high... Uh, level of mental health conditions in this age group, the outcomes can be strongly improved by uh, following the guidelines that were written and led by the Royal Children's Hospital. And we have a research program, which is dominated by Trans20, which is a longitudinal cohort study to improve the health of trans youth. And um, I was delighted that this project could get up only through uh, the 
generous support of the Royal Children's Hospital Foundation, um, and in particular, the Hugh Williamson Foundation, who sponsored um, this project and has led to it um, now reaching into um, the fourth year. Um, and what we aim to do with the Trans20 project is to evaluate the, um, the gender identity, the mental health, the physical health, the educational status, the quality of life and the family functioning of all children and young people who come to the gender service and then follow these variables over hopefully a period of 20 years. And this will give us the data that we require to improve the care that we're providing and also to ultimately improve the mental health outcome of this cohort of young people. Thank you, Sue, over to you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, that's an incredible presentation. Thank you. Uh, and for all the incredible work that you and the team are doing within the gender service, thank you so much. I know it's making a remarkable difference um, to the lives of young people right across Australia. Uh, so don't forget, folks, if you have any questions for Rick or Michelle, drop them in the chat now and we'll come back to them a little later on. Our next guest is Adam Blake, who's the nurse unit manager on Banksia, which is the hospital's dedicated mental health ward. He provides operational leadership to the team and has previously held senior positions at Austin Health and the Office of the Chief Mental Health Nurse. So welcome, Adam. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sue. Um, really glad to be here and just so glad that we have a focus on mental health here. And so I'm here to talk about our uh, Banksia Award and um, I'll just go to the next slide. So I don't know how much time I have, but we'll try and get through the slides that I have. We're a 16 bed uh, ward at the Royal Children's uh, Hospital. Uh, we uh, cater for young people between the ages of 13 and 18, uh, mainly from the Western met metropolitan and Western regional areas of Victoria. Um, but we are statewide as well. So, um, it is the RCH. A lot of people actually bypass their local hospital, come to us, um, which is great, uh, but it's, it's, it's also uh, quite a demand on our systems as well. Uh, Banksia provides acute assessment and crisis stabilisation, as well as planned intensive treatment interventions. So uh, the, the, the young people that are presenting to uh, our Banksia ward have uh, a, a myriad of um, uh, presentations, uh, including mood disorders, emotional dysregulation, psychosis. Um, we're really looking at the, the pointy end of mental health. And this is a, a service um, when people really can't be contained in the, in the community or, or, or supported in the community. So we've evolved uh, from uh, humble beginnings. And this is a picture of the first uh, psychiatric centre uh, in the Travancore uh, area. And, and we've really moved into uh, a modern contemporary uh, service. Um, and, and we expanded from 12 to 16 beds in 2013. And voila, look at, look at the Royal Children's Hospital now. Um, we're very proud to be a part of um, this, this um, hospital. Our, our primary uh, aim on Banksia is to provide episodes of intensive mental health support to st stabilise um, uh, mental health disorders, uh, initiate adaptive change within when these disorders cannot be safely and effectively uh, treated in their current context or environment. Um, and the ward service uh, focuses on enabling a young person to be safe and functioning in the community and supports outpatient uh, mental health care and treatment. Um, I've just put a couple of pictures on around our catchment area just to provide some context around who we service. Um, if we look at the purple regions, um, that's uh, most of our uh, area. And on the right hand side, we'll see a lot of um, the western uh, parts of Victoria serviced by uh, the Royal Children's Hospital. This is a very small slide and I won't go into it, just to say that we have an expansive uh, group of clinicians, specialist clinicians 
uh, that uh, provide the care on Banksia, including consultant psychiatrists, care coordinators, our nursing team. And we're really endeavoring to expand our allied health uh, profession and uh, go into um, diversional therapy, occupational therapy, um, music therapy. We understand that these uh, subspecialties are integral to um, a, a young person's journey through their mental health. We offer individual reviews, we offer uh, therapy programs, um, social inclusion, uh, we have a live wire uh, program, which is um, funded by the Starlight Foundation, a great uh, program that uh, um, steps into our ward. Uh, we have educational supports and um, we're, we're really uh, engaging our young people in programs like safe wards and um, looking at trauma-informed care and, and uh, integrating mental health intensive care. So uh, cutting edge, uh, evidence-based care. This is just a, a quick snapshot of a bedroom of, of Banksia. So um, modest and, um, and contained. Um, uh, and I just wanted to just touch on uh, Toby's story. So this is a, a snapshot of who Toby is and how our, our ward has uh, supported. So Toby, 16 year old, uh, acute onset of psychosis and mania. Uh, unfortunately, Toby has been witness to family violence. Um, he's had some increasing delusional thoughts and agitation and distress of the family um, has uh, allowed them to call um, for support and, and that supports in, in, in the way of uh, Banksia. So the admission to Banksia, um, Toby came in, experienced visual hallucinations and auditory hallucinations. Um, he was provided care within the intensive care area. Um, this is a specialty area um, with specific nurses available to uh, provide um, what, it, what it says, an intensive environment uh, of care. We try to integrate music therapy, daily um, sessions with our consultant and care coordinator. Uh, and an individualized medication regime. We started building on his existing coping strategies and understood that we can collaborate with the family to enhance what uh, the, um, the, the care would look like in the, in the community. And we walk, walk, walk through or work through uh, some of the trauma over the two and a half weeks that he stayed. This is um, representative of of uh, most of our young people that will come on to the ward. Um, and and it, it represents, um, I guess, uh, the admission to discharge uh, pathway. We take referrals from emergency departments, uh, CAMS and Kim services, external private public psychiatrists and psychologists and mental health clinicians. And we also transfer from other um, metro and regional hospitals. I know this is a really uh, small um, uh, graph here, but I just wanted to touch on our um, demand of which Rick has spoken about earlier. You know, our demand has increased, um, you know, as you said, Rick, about 50%. And we can see from our emergency department, um, we've got in 2021 referrals above 250 uh, for the Banksy Award. Our total admissions per month, we don't have the June data here, so apologies for that, but you know, we're uh, around 43 uh, in May to 2020, and our discharge is around 45. The length of stay, we, it's a really challenging thing because we say to families, this is an acute um, mental health ward, um, but there's a lot that needs to be done. And, uh, we have a lot of families that say, look, uh, this is a situation, surely um, we need more time. Um, but as the case is, we have 16 beds uh, and are working through half of the state. So it's really uh, uh, integral that we get on and do what we need to do in the time that's, um, that we have available. 
and the length of stay at the moment is sitting around six days. And this is a, a, another um, indicative uh, representation of how much demand that we have and thinking around our bed capacity. Our focus for 2022 is, is uh, navigating our increased demand, um, you know, during uh, our pandemic, which continues. We have a nationwide shortage of uh, nursing workforce at the moment, which is um, very uh, challenging. Um, but we do have um, a lot of people working internationally to find our nursing workforce as well. Increased allied health and specialist nursing, as I uh, spoke about, and we really need to uh, engage a sensory modulation um, as a part of reducing um, uh, the tra trauma and distress on young people that uh, visit our, our ward. Um, I won't go through all of that, but. I just wanted to say I'm really proud of our new mural. Um, we had this commission by an artist called Dave Hook. Um, his street name is Megs. Um, and uh, this was done in uh, the mid part of 2021 and it has revolutionized that space. So there's, there's a lot of create, creativity in Banksia and uh, yeah, we're quite proud of, of the service that we provide. Adam, thank you so much. Thank you for all the work that you and all your colleagues are doing on Banksia and for talking to us about the program today and, and how you're supporting our young people. Um, so now to round out our, our kind of suite of presentations about what's going on uh, at the Royal Children's and on the campus, it's my pleasure to introduce to our two final guests for this afternoon, Ari Krishnan and Polly Sinjin. Annie and Polly are both experienced NICU nurses working on Butterfly, which is the hospital's neonative intensive care unit, hence the NICU. Um, Polly has been working as a NICU nurse for over 16 years and during her career, she's worked at the Royal Children's Hospital, the Royal Women's and at multiple neonatal units in London in the UK. And Arnie has worked on an, in a number of settings, including the Royal Women's Hospital, and uh, has completed a graduate certificate in NICU and later a master's in advanced, nurse practice, advanced nursing practice. So as well as working as clinicians, Polly and Arnie are both cocoon care coordinators, supporting the cocoon program on Butterfly. So Arnie and Polly are going to tell you more about this incredible program, which along with the Cocoon Care Coordinator positions are made possible to the, from the generous support uh, from the RCH Foundation's BED Sponsorship Program. And we're delighted to be able to do that. So thanks, Arnie and Polly, over to you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, we're really, really excited. Uh, it's nice to be away from the unit and come and share um, some of the great work that we're doing there. Um, so Cocoon is a... Uh, model of care that we practice on Butterfly. We're very big into branding, so we are the Butterfly unit and we have our circle of care optimising outcomes for newborns, Cocoon. We like to think of it of um, putting the baby at the centre of the care and wrapping the family around in um, everything that they need when they come into hospital. Um, so what is Cocoon and what is the role of the Cocoon nurse? Um, so we are a quality improvement project. Um, we are a model of care. We have two main aims, which is to improve our health outcomes for our infants and to improve the experience of our families. Um, now this is done with our three pillared approach. So our first approach is our first pillar rather is our staff education. So we know that we can't um, operate as best as we can without the help of our amazing RCH staff. So we have a number of resources and educational resources that we um, have put together with current evidence-based practice um, that we use to um, better educate our staff and um, support our parents and families. And um, this includes our 10 hour study day and our online resources as well. We also have our parent education. So we partner with our parents to um, get them to know their baby from the get-go. So they're in a highly medicalized intensive care environment and we partner with them to um, work through their child's intensive care journey. Um, and our last pillar is our um, Cocoon Care Bundle, which encompasses Polly and I. So we give them, um, share more resources, some, um, access to us as cocoon care coordinators and we kind of facilitate the journey between um, nursing staff, medical staff, allied health um, and really partner with them um, as we move forward. 
Um, we also have our neurodevelopmental ward rounds, which are really amazing. So they give the parents the opportunity to um, get to know their baby um, and work through where they are in their diagnosis and um, how we can facilitate infant and parent bonding. Um, Another really important part is that on top of receiving the um, complex medical care and surgical care that they receive in Butterfly is acknowledging that these parents are coming in, they can't stay on our unit. So they quite often leave their babies. Um, we are not a maternity tertiary centre. So mums recovering from their own complex medical needs are, are you know, being discharged from their maternity centres to come be with their babies and then leaving them at night. So that's something that we try and facilitate bonding and a positive experience when they come in. Um, and we really, check in with them throughout their whole journey and um, help them. Yeah. How did we get started? Quality Improvement Project. And we could not be here without the generosity of the RCH Foundation. So on top of working clinically, which um, Sue mentioned before, we, we do this role, um, which is funded by the RCH Foundation. Um, it's really important to note that we are a consumer-based program. So we are built upon um, surveying previous parents and current um, parents. So we sit them down and go through a myriad of qualitative and quantitative data that they give to us. Um, we sift through and we constantly adapt. Um, and also um, staff surveys too, which were initially conducted by a medical director Lee Higgy in 2015. Um, and we continually um, adapt and listen to what our staff are saying about um, the parent environment and the NICU and how we can um, get better. Pass you on to Polly. Lovely. So um, how has Cocoon um, assisted in bonding between parents and families? Well, we know that there, um, that if there is to be a strong connection between baby and family, we really, we really need to encourage that connection um, from day one. Day one. Uh, therefore, the aim of Cocoon is to foster that, that relationship as much as we can. However, every baby and every family is very different and there's, there's no one size fits all um, for these parents or these families. So ways that we help families um, often... Um, a, little, a little baby will come in and they're, um, they're needing, needing breathing support and complex infusion, lots of medication, lots of different things. So you've got a parent at a bedside who is looking at their baby thinking, what can I do for my baby? Um, we offer, uh, we, we give each parent an admission bag, which has a little scent cloth in it, which is a little piece of material that mums can put in their bra to get the scent of their breast milk. And we put that next to the baby. Um, we also encourage mums and dads to read to their babies, to talk to them and to sing to them, um, as well as providing um, positive touch. Once a baby starts to get a bit better, we um, try to get them out for um, skin to skin contact um, and, and cuddling. And from the get go, we try and get them to be involved in as much of the care as possible. So helping with things like nappy changes, bathing, changing their linen, um, dressing them, weighing them um, and playing with them as well. We also um, support parents in um, trying to learn things for their baby when they go home. So a baby may go home with a, a feeding tube or with oxygen or special medication or other respiratory support. Um, we, we thought it'd be helpful just to um, share a, a patient's story, um, uh, some feedback we got from um, a mum and dad. So this is little Collins. Um, little Collins was born at um, 26 weeks gestation, so that's 14 weeks early. She was only very, very tiny. She was only 540 grams when she came to us. And mum and dad were um, from... Warrnambool, which is 300 k's away from uh, the children's hospital. Little Collins came for abdominal surgery um, and her mum and her mum wrote some um, beautiful words for us, which I'll share with you now, um, just to sort of convey about her, um, her mental health and, and that of her partner. Um, it's hard to convey just how disorientating it is to first arrive to an ICU as an outsider. The sounds, the machines, the medications, the terminology, all the different faces, it's all daunting. And that's not even mentioning the health, the medical hurdles that were facing our little girl. Having the cocoon, cocoon nurse coordinators on the ward meant seeing a familiar face daily during our stay on Butterfly. When the nursing staff changes um, every shift and we sometimes didn't see our doctor's lead doctor for a few weeks, it was lovely to feel that we knew someone. And just as importantly, we started to feel known. The cocoon care coordinators got to know us as parents, learning the things that we did to help, caring with our, help, help care for our daughter and helping us to extend not only our skills, but our confidence in looking after our little girl. In a space where so many of the usual early milestones are taken away, and so many of the acts of bonding with a baby are impossible to achieve, this helped us to feel important and connected as carers and parents in our little girl's life. 
The cocoon, cocoon care coordinators also got to know us as people. The simple things like a conversation about a shared interest or celebrating our baby's progress made immense difference when we were facing not, not just days or weeks, but months, um, looking at the same small space for many hours a day. And little, cook, um, little Collins was with us for five months and then got transferred um, to another ward in the children's. Um, we also appreciated the expert, their expertise as nurses. On days when things had changed in the treatment or condition of our little girl, they were able to explain to us what was going on or otherwise they would follow um, by requesting one of the doctors to come and speak to us if we, if we still needed um, more information. We were grateful for the way they looked after us as parents, letting us feel that looking after ourselves would also help us look after our little girl. They shared with us ways in which we could seek seek further support if we needed it and offered um, the hospital support if they thought it could make a difference. And even as we transferred to another ward, they asked after us um, each time we saw them in the hospital and have kept an eye on our little family, uh, little family's journey ever since. To us, this seems to encapsulate the idea of Cocoon, our wraparound care that looks after the whole family. In a space that necessarily has to that necessarily has to focus on physical well-being of little ones, the Cocoon program recognises the role as parents and helps them to feel and be important in a space where they are some where they are otherwise um, left feeling so painfully disconnected. So. Well, that's um, amazing. Thank you so much, um, Annie and Polly. Um, I, I come back to that incredible testimonial. I, I want to ask you a bit about that, but that's um, it's incredible. Um, and thank you so much for giving us this, an insight into one particular program where um, philanthropy is supporting, uh, is supporting um, I guess in this case, our smallest patients. And, and thank you for your hard work indeed. Um, so an enormous thank you to each and every one of our panellists today for being here and providing us with incredible insight into, I think what everyone can uh, agree is a, a wide ranging um, array of uh, services that the RCH is able uh, to deliver um, and how the whole campus is, you know, helping to um, manage children and young people's mental health. So I'm delighted now to open it up for questions, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope that you're going to tap away furiously on your, uh, on your keyboards there at home uh, because we really want to get a great discussion happening. So a reminder, please, chat, please type your questions into the chat function, select all attendees and panellists, um, and let me know uh, which of the panellists your question is for. Um, so to, to, to kick us off, um, I'm good. There's, a, there's one comment here at the moment, and um, as they say uh, in the media, I'll take it as a comment, not as a question, uh, but from, uh, from the lovely Mary Mack, uh, Michelle Telfer is a true leader, and the world needs more people like her, not only for the gender service, but for mental health overall. I do wish we could clone her, <laughs> and thank you for this webinar today. Um, and I just, I think I would add to Mary's comment, which is to say, and she typed this very early on, but I would say, I think we would love to clone every single one of the panelists here today for the incredible uh, work that they're doing. So thank you so much. And thank you, Mary, for, for, for tapping in. Um, so I'm gonna kick us off while we wait for you to, um, to type in your questions. Rick, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay. Sure. Um, we know that over the past few years, the Royal Children's Hospital has seen an increase in the number of mental health presentations. Can you talk to us about the hospital's address, how, how the hospital's addressing that? Yeah, thanks, Sue. I mean, it's been quite a phenomenon, really, the, um, the way in which we've seen young people with anxiety, depression, aggression, eating disorders presenting in record numbers. And it's the emergency department that really is the, the sort of focus of that. And the Children's has really by far the busiest emergency department in Victoria for mental health challenges in, in children and, and adolescents. So one of the things that we did was we brought on more staff in the emergency department, so mental health clinicians, essentially around the clock, because in fact, a lot of mental health difficulties really come to a head, you know, not nine to five, not, not in business hours. So we've increased our staffing in the ED to essentially being around the clock. We also brought in a thing called a rapid review clinic, which is a next day clinic for assessing young people who, whilst they came in during the night, can actually have their review the next day. So they can go home and have a sleep and then come in for that review. Uh, we brought on new doctors, so new junior doctors, um, who we hope will become the paediatricians and psychiatrists of the future. Um, and there was one thing that I was really pleased that we got going, which was a program that we called Compass. 
So this was a partnership with the Primary Health Network in uh, Northwest Melbourne and with the Centre for Community Child Health. And so we essentially built a, a community with uh, GPs and paediatricians in, in our area, uh, fun fundamentally to help them to support children with mental health difficulties and really prevent them needing to come into an emergency department, including ours. So we offered training sessions every week for the, uh, the specialists with one of our child and adolescent psychiatrists. Uh, and we also sort of provided that over the shoulder, last minute as needed uh, clinical advice for their, their patients. And it was incredibly well received and evaluated and we were pleased to present it to various uh, health ministers, um, uh, state and federal. But I think it's a great model to, um, you know, when we only have emergency departments and specialist service like ours to make sure that we're continually reaching out and, you know, we call it building capacity. So that's really what we did. We sort of looked at the emergency department and then we also looked outwards. Um, thank you. This is, um, we, we've got a question that's come up from, from Natalie. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you maybe, and, and I'll throw it open to the to the whole panel, if you like, it, it just, it's interesting because it's kind of the flip side of the coin to asking how you manage the, the health service um, in the hospital. Natalie said, thank you for the information, the excellent discussion. Um, how do the RCH staff manage the work that they do? How is your mental health? Well, well, do you want to start, Adam? Look, uh, I think uh, it's a brilliant quest question, and and you know, um, I, I you know, there's no health without mental health. You know, we, we know that. Um, but in terms of our our own, uh, from I'm talking about inpatient care and the 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 nursing staff and the clinicians and the multidisciplinary team that we have at the RCH, we we do. Um, click together, we, we are a cohesive team and we um, provide a range of supports, whether it's group supervision, individual supervision, uh, we have employee assistance programs um, and, and we do have a peer support network as well that um, helps uh, in those really uh, challenging times. Mm, thank you, and add to it, Michelle? Yeah, so we've also got, um, a person who's specifically employed at the Royal Children's Hospital to manage staff mental health. Mm. And this is a new role and we've found it exceptionally helpful for our team because we do see a lot of young people who are, are struggling um, and who, who bring um, a lot of their distress to us um, uh, that, that we take on uh, necessarily as part of providing their care. And um, this new staff lead um, has helped bring our team together through some wellness activities um, and within work time, done some work in reflection, mindfulness, well-being. They even organised a special breakfast for our team and a coffee machine. And it's sort of the small things that um, add to a sense of feeling valued and appreciated that I think has um, helped ease some of that burden. That's uh, great leadership and great connection to the staff, isn't it? So well done, RCH. Anyone want to add Polly, Christian? So the good old debrief in the tea room always helps as well. Yeah. With your <laughs> colleagues true. talking through things. I think that's the main thing that we do, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think with all of the um, different services and definitely listening um, to you guys, you can't walk through water without getting wet. So like having those support services um, and like, I mean, wellbeing initiative, we got bread club. So giving a bunch of over like tired nurses some carbs is a great, it's a great fix to working <laughs> on your mental health. Indeed. Rick, can't be the only one not to say something there. No, I mean, Michelle was spot on about Husna and the whole, there's actually an RCH mental health staff wellbeing strategy. And so I think um, particularly with the, the pandemic, I think it's, pretty, it's just so important that we can, I mean, in mental health, we're all, we, we're quite used to supervision and regular meetings to discuss the content of, of, um, of the care and the challenges that we might have with, uh, with parents or with young people. But um, I think the wider hospital, it's probably been a bit neglected. And I, I'd, I'd like to think that the children's is probably ahead of the, um, ahead of the pack with in, in hospital care and looking after staff. Mm, great, thank you. So great reinforcement there. Thank, fantastic question, Natalie. Thank you, gave everyone the opportunity to, to, to say something wonderful uh, about where they work. Um, Michelle, I'm going to ask a question for you now. Um, 
the extraordinary rise in referrals that you pointed out to us on the slide in the, uh, the gender service in recent years, how are you meeting that demand? Yes, it's, it's certainly been uh, an incredible rise in demand and we've also gained uh, more staff um, in our clinical programs. But I think one of the, uh, the best interventions and innovations that we have commenced is, um, is a, a clinic we, we, refer to initially, we referred to initially as SNAC, so it's the Single Session Nurse-Led Assessment Clinic. And this was uh, the brainchild of our clinical nurse consultant, Donna Eat, who's also been um, uh, supported mm. through the Royal Children's Hospital, Hospital Foundation. And Donna came to me with an idea because um, she was managing our waiting list, which was growing and growing over time. And she said that she seemed to be spending a lot of time on the phone helping parents who were distressed about the wait times and trying to link them in. And she thought, I should be spending this time with the young people as well as the parents and hearing from them what their needs are while they're waiting. And so she set up this single session clinic. So someone's referred before they get to the point of having a formal assessment with a pediatrician and the psychiatrist or psychologist, they see the nurse. And at that stage, it was, it was just Donna. It's grown since then, but it was just initially Donna. And Donna would assess where they're at from a risk perspective in terms of their mental health, but also what their goals were in coming to the gender service. And she could then provide them with uh, some navigation and, um, and uh, advice on where to link in for peer support, where the families could access um, parent support through community-based organisations. She could help link them with mental health services and GPs who are supportive of trans young people. And what we found is that many of the young people who were being referred to us who didn't really want a medical pathway were redirected appropriately where they could actually access what they needed and others could um, be uh, affirmed and supported within a family context whilst waiting. And we evaluated this through the Trans20 project, which, as I said, has been uh, supported through the foundation as well been highly dependent on the foundation actually it sort of, uh, just um, brings it to, to, to light um, really in talking about all of our innovations but through the trans 20 program we were able to assess a young person's mental health so looking at depression anxiety as well as family function and quality of life and what we found um, was that just that one session to help link families in with the supports they need improved anxiety, depression, and quality of life. Um, and so we've continued it and with the rising numbers, expanded it to include our junior doctor, uh, so our, our uh, registrars and fellows. And they've also gained the experience then in working with young people and, and families. Um, and uh, it's just lovely to see um, everyone grow in this space. Um, and it's clearly improved care and that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I know we, because we have some um, RCH auxiliaries members on the call and um, they were very pleased that uh, Donna, has, uh, Donna Ead was um, the Dame Elizabeth Murdoch nursing scholar, uh, nursing development scholar uh, one year, not so, not so long ago. And the auxiliaries of course support, um, support that scholarship. And so uh, I know that her, you know, she, she really improved her practice uh, through the research she was able to do um, with that scholarship. So, um, I'm going to um, I'm going to be a slight, continue to be editorial here for a minute because I think what you were saying and talking about the the impact that one session, the impact that it had, and come back to the uh, wonderful testimonial that that Polly uh, wrote about the impact from that fan, from Collins, uh, mum and dad. Um, I guess just um, any anyone on the panel just speak to us, you know, um, briefly about that sense of impact. I guess what it, it, you know, how you feel, what that means to you when you can say, yes, that, you know, we've had an impact on a family, on a, you know, a patient, just something that, that kind of gives, brings to light just how important that sense of impact to, is to, to your practice as, as well as to the family. Polly, do you want to kick us off? I think that's why we all do what we do to um, make a difference. Um, and Arnie and I both looked after um, little Collins and receiving that letter was amazing to know that um, the cocoon program had affected her in that way. Mm. Um, and little Collins was with us for such a long time and she was a tiny baby when she was when she first came. And by the time she left RCH, she was, I don't know, maybe five times her birth weight. Yeah. <laughs> so it was pretty um, incredible for us. But, um, yeah, 
receiving that letter was pretty amazing yeah. to know that it made such a difference. I think it's really important to know that when um, families come to RCH, especially in our environment, they're actually um, experiencing like quite distressing signs and symptoms of like acute stress disorder. Mm. So things like shortness of breath, um, nausea, anxiety, poor sleep. And they're really quite at the point of, you know, combustion. And sometimes it happens. Um, our parents are really um, struggling. Um, and a lot of the time the feedback and the impact isn't really seen until um, quite further down along the, tri uh, along the track when they can kind of distill their thoughts and kind of reflect on their experience. So we encourage a lot of, you know, journaling and getting in touch with um, other mental health specialists, their infant mental health team, because um, we recognise it's really quite difficult, but it's that kind of that ending later on, that catharsis that, um, um, that we see quite later on or when you see, you know, kids later on in their journey with RCH or when they've gone home or when they keep in touch. So it's not always um, as visible, but it is there. Have you been surprised at how, um, how quickly the program pr produced results for families and their baby? Yeah, I think um, a, lot of, a lot of people on the ward comment to us all the time about what the Cocoon program has done. I think the, the most important thing we've seen is there's been increased parental presence at the mm -hmm. bedside, mm -hmm. which is what we're really trying to encourage. Um, we know that if um, mums and dads are at the bedside, their babies tend to do better mm -hmm. um, and they can advocate for their child um, from the, the get-go. So I think that's the most important thing. But even in, um, in intensive care, we've got, we're looking after the sickest babies in Victoria um, seeing um, very unwell babies who are requiring ventilation coming out for skin to skin cuddles. Mm. I remember when I started the RCH, you know, in 2005, I saw that very infrequently, but I see that all the time now. Um, so I think that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And small interventions like reading and talking to your baby yeah. um, is a great early predictor for early infant vocalisations. And that's a small intervention that you can say to parents actually at the right moment, come in and speak to your baby. They don't know our voice, but they know your voice from, you know, their in utero experience. Um, talk to them and, and it helps with bonding. So it's kind of a holistic approach to um, yeah. yeah, which we can see really quickly the effects of. I was just going to say too, we, um, mums are often really good at being at the bedside and watching a baby and getting involved, but dads um, are not so good at sitting at a bedside. So when we did we did this readathon last year um, and the dads loved it. They really embraced it um, and we had all certificates going it was, and the dads loved it. So doing small, even small little things can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. mm, great, thank you. Um, I've got a question here from, uh, from Barry. Um, will we be expanding our in-hospital and outpatient practical capacity and to what extent are such services also to be expanded in the outer metropolitan state and state health services? Am I Rick, you might want to reflect on those to begin with. And... Yeah, I mean, at the moment, um, uh, Barry, the services such as ours meet probably a third of the demand for serious and complex mental health disorders. So there's other children, uh, the other 70% are going somewhere else or, or going nowhere um, in terms of getting care. So I think that building the capacity of um, parents and young people to recognise their difficulties and also then to be able to... Um, I guess navigate the system as it is, is is crucial. So this is why I think the building capacity and building literacy, building the understanding in the community of mental health concerns is critical. And you've made reference um, to sort of outer metro and regional, uh, which are just so important in Victoria because the availability of special, you know, child psychiatrists and psychologists and so forth, mental health clinicians is lower. So uh, I think we have to think of ways such as using telehealth and using innovative means um, for developing the capacity of clinicians who are in those areas. So I, I'm a big fan of building that capacity sort of virtually, but in, in our service, we're hoping to be three times the size in 10 years, and that way we'll be meeting 100% of the demand. Great, thank you so much. Um, Leon, uh, I hope it's Leone, uh, um, it might be Leone as well. So Leone, I hope I'm pronouncing uh, correctly. Um, general question for the panel. Um, actually, Adam, we might get you to kick off with this first. Has any thought been given to using mental health first aiders in this space? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, um, a good question. Um, we do have um, a program that runs through the Department of Health um, with uh, undergraduate um, uh, registered nursing students. Um, so we have uh, younger, uh, well, we have uh, um, nursing students that are in their 
second or third year and they are a part of our diversional therapy program and they are working with um, our diversional therapist Tony to engage and provide activity programs uh, for our young people which is, has made a world of difference. Um, but to Leonie's question around mental health first aiders, um, as a tertiary hospital, we would be uh, looking for uh, a qualification um, as a specialty um, service, yeah. Yeah, great. Any, any other reflections on that question, Rick in particular? Matt? Um, yeah, I think within the children's, we, we probably uh, don't have uh, mental health first aid uh, staff, but I think there's endless capacity for us to help and support the training and the, the, the work of those uh, those professionals. Yeah, and that, right. So, Sue, so that's, yeah. that's really what it's about with this uh, undergraduate nursing program. It's about growing our own and um, retaining the staff uh, for RCH. Great, thank you. And I'm going to... Um, throw one more to you, um, Adam, while, I, while I've got you there. Um, talk to us a bit about the impact of philanthropy on the Banksy Award and, and how philanthropy can continue to support the growth of the program. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, Sue. And, and I think we have touched on diversional therapy as a, as a model of what we can do in, in um, uh, Banksia and the uh, philanthropic, uh, philanthropic uh, nature of giving to that program has uh, extended it um, twofold. So we started uh, diversional therapy in 2021 uh, with an aim to engage our young people uh, when they're in the, uh, their admission phase. And this is about, um, I guess, getting people involved in activity, uh, more socialisation, um, which uh, in turn decreases opportunities for uh, escalation or um, agitation. So um, we wouldn't be where we are with this program without uh, the RCH Foundation. Um, we work with a lot, a lot of sensory modulation, which uh, is a fancy word for um, distraction um, uh, equipment. Um, and the, the, the issue is with this is that uh, often it's single use and uh, in a hospital that, which uh, is, um, you know, absolutely concerned about in, around the infection control, we need to think about how we replenish stock uh, to enable uh, every young person to be um, uh, to have the available resources that they need to regulate themselves. Great, thank you so much. Um, folks, there's two absolutely marvellous uh, comments here, which I'm going to make and then, uh, and then I will probably ask Rick for one last question, unless something pops up in the meantime. So get in quick if you want something, uh, to ask something, if you're burning question. So here, one from Robin, uh, which is uh, wonderful, is this webinar is so inspiring and as a member of an auxiliary who supports the emergency department, it's wonderful to know the fantastic care which is offered in 2022 to children with mental health needs. Thank you, Robin. Uh, it's a fantastic bit of feedback for, for all of the panel. And then one from Jasmine, which I think is, you know, probably is, is the highlight of, of today, really. Um, having had our son in the NICU for two weeks, 30 years ago on a jet ventilator, <laughs> He is now an astrophysicist and lecturer. Many thanks. <laughs> Yay, hurrah. <laughs> Jasmine, thank you so much. And, and uh, I'm, I'm sure he is, um, whether he's an astrophysicist or anything else, he would be your absolute delight. So everybody is thrilled with that. the jet ventilator, he would have been very, very sick 30 years ago. He would have been yeah, a very yeah, sick right. boy. Yeah, That's really. amazing. Yeah, That's mm. amazing. so there you go. What mm. incredible care. Thank you, RCH. Um, and from... Uh, and from Beck at the Good Friday Appeal, thank you for the fantastic overview and the important work that you do from the Good Friday Appeal and partners like the Cuba Foundation. We're thrilled to be supporting the outstanding work to support young people and their mental health at the Royal Children's Hospital. Rebecca, thank you so much. We heartily agree and to have such partners is incredible. And of course, as we know, 90, over 90 years of the Good Friday Appeal. Uh, and 100 years this year of the auxiliaries just goes to show how the community really supports all of the work um, of the hospital. 
So to finish off, uh, to finish off the Q&A section, I'd like to ask Rick you one final question. And so just imagine that a donor was wanting to give you a million dollars tomorrow. How would you use those funds? Oh, well, Sue, where to start? But I mean, um, there's, there's one, one thing that hasn't been built. There's one thing that's been tried and there's one thing that we have a platform to expand. Um, the thing that hasn't been built is we haven't built a short stay unit for mental health difficulties in or next to our emergency department. So I think uh, designing and developing a model of care for a small, maybe three or four bed area for short stay would be um, a game changer for the, for the children's. Um, the actual space of the children's where the emergency department is, is a bit constricted and it's dark and it's, it's, um, it's uh, on the lower ground floor, but I think developing a, a model and a, a, um, uh, a form, if you like, for a short stay unit, I think it's, it's time and that would be honestly a, a game changer. Uh, the thing that we have a platform for is a thing called Mental Health Central, which is a, a website uh, as part of the campus mental health strategy. And so Mental Health Central will be a repository for all sorts of information for families and for young people and for professionals about mental health. And I think the opportunities to really, um, you know, pr pretty much go to town on uh, what we might offer in terms of training and development for professionals through Mental Health Central is there. So the platform's there, it's pretty much ready to go. What we now, now need is the, the content that will help, a, a, you know, a, a mental health nurse in Ballarat or a paediatrician in Wodonga or whatever. So I think that's something which is a platform that, that's ready. And uh, my third one would be something which we've tried, which is the Compass program, which I'd mentioned. So we've tried it out. We've shown that paediatricians and GPs are really thirsting for this sort of support from specialist mental health. And I really think that a hospital like the Children's could have a major impact across Victoria by expanding something that we've just done in Western Melbourne uh, across Victoria. So that'd be the three things. A short stay unit uh, would be amazing. Um, training and development through the Mental Health Central. Um, and then I guess also that capacity building expansion of Compass. Right, thank you so much. That's um, really insightful answers. And, um, and I think that's incredible because you, those sort of things that any donor could have huge impact with. Um, I, I don't want to leave anyone else out, so there might be burning things anyone else wants to say. Michelle would probably say, let's make sure that Trans20 gets the full 20 years of, of research, but anything else? Absolutely. Um, I think Trans20 is, um, it's such an important project for the gender service. And I, I reflecting on, um, on the growth and also some of the, the controversy that has come up uh, in uh, it, with regards to trans healthcare over the last couple of years, one of the things that I've been incredibly grateful for in having Trans20 is that we've got the data to show that what we do is making a really positive difference. And I would hate to think how we would have navigated some of the um, the pushback from from those who don't have a progressive kind of thinking, who don't have the progressive thinking on this issue if we didn't have that data um, and that evidence to say, if you support trans young people in this way, their outcomes are significant. And while we can talk about the young people who come through, who become school captains or who get scholarships to, um, to university, the, it's, it's the hard data, the, the medical data that we can publish to put with the stories. Um, and together mm. it's inargu inarguable. Um, so I, I, I would like to see that our Trans20 research does go through to that 20 year period of time because it will certainly um, be helpful for this cohort, I think, and for the community um, more broadly. Yeah, thank you. So you can hear folks in those two answers, the, the, the kind of um, the funding pillars that we think helps drive excellence, so the great clinical care, uh, the learning, whether it's learning for uh, clinicians and researchers, um, and of course, um, and of course, research in and of itself to provide yeah. the data and so forth. So, and so, my, my last comment on Trans Twenty in terms of coming a long way with the research that we're doing is we now have um, four people with lived experience um, who are researchers on the Trans Twenty project. Mm -hmm. um, 
they're uh, trans or gender diverse themselves and they bring just this uh, wealth of experience and, and knowledge that we couldn't otherwise um, have in a team and the diversity is, um, has really um, assisted the research and we're bringing in uh, young uh, adolescents um, who are also helping to design what we do and not just from a research perspective but also in our clinical programs and it's just it's, it's growing tremendously. So Adam or Polly or? Look I, 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 I'll take the opportunity. Um, I think you know we are a specialist mental health service and we want to grow, we want to be uh, the best mental health service that we can uh, deliver. And, and to do that, we need the help of, of uh, donors and, and the RCH Foundation. And it, it doesn't go unnoticed. The small amounts, the large amounts, it all helps. If we are wanting to um, expand into subspecialties, eating disorders, um, I would like every young person that visits our service to have the equal opportunity uh, to get the resources they need for their recovery. Thank you. Other end of the panel. I think just to continue on with the cocoon programs, it ends in January. So to yep. can continue our role would be yeah, great. Great, yeah. thank you. And, and I, I loved what Adam said in particular. Um, we always ask that question about the million dollars at these centres to give you the sense of, you know, of impact. But as Adam said, every every dollar counts and every every contribution is meaningful and as long as it's meaningful to, for you as donors. So um, we, we can see just how uh, grateful we all are and how impactful it is to our clinicians. So um, thanks all for, for saying all of that. So, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, officially concludes our event for this afternoon. I'd like to take the opportunity to once again thank all of our panellists for their time, for coming off campus, uh, and for sharing your insights into the vital mental health projects um, that initiatives that are taking a place right across the campus right now. It was incredible to learn more about the impact that uh, those projects are having um, and therefore that our general su generous supporters are having and how it translates into great patient care. And finally, to you all, our incredibly passionate supporters, and thank you all for such a wide range of, uh, of different groups that you've tuned in today. Thank you for joining us. It was fantastic to be able to share this event with you. Um, and I'd like to be able to, I'd like to thank you for your generosity and your commitment to not only the foundation, but most importantly, of course, to the Royal Children's Hospital. As you've heard today, philanthropy is making an incredible uh, difference and an incredible impact to the lives of patients at the hospital. Um, and it's thanks to your support that we can continue to tackle the big health challenges uh, that are there um, in the lives of children and young people. So the mental health strategy is crucial to improving the lives of our young people. And we know that it's going to make a significant difference in making sure that all patients are looked after both physically and mentally when they walk through the door. And without the funding uh, that um, those incredible uh, supporters that I mentioned earlier um, uh, are doing, the, mental, the Mel Melbourne Children's Mental Health Strategy would not have been possible. So if you'd like to make a contribution, to the mental health strategy, we'd love to hear from you. Please contact Ali Pekin, who's our manager of individual giving, and her details are in the chat function, I believe, right now. And we also have great opportunities to support the RCH philanthropically through our bed sponsorship program, our workplace giving, our children's tree, which is our monthly giving program. And of course, you can join us um, by letting us know uh, that you uh, would like to leave a gift in your will to change the lives of future children and their uh, future generations. And that's our 1870 society as well. And of course, if you want to um, uh, fund research, you can do that by giving to RCH 1000 also and join a great group of like-minded people. So please let us know, please contact us. The details are there in the chat function. Um, and we once again, thank you so much for everything that you're doing for us. We couldn't do what we do without you. And I think you have heard today that our clinicians and researchers feel the same way. Thank you all very much. Have a lovely afternoon for the rest of it. And let's hope it gets a bit warmer as the week goes by. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>